But they're here in the week of it. <laughs> As people start coming in, um, just a reminder, if you're going to claim CME, you want to do it on the app or online before April. Um, and that uh, next year we'll be in Clearwater. So save the date for February 3rd through 6th. Uh, I'm Stephen McNatt. I'm from Wake Forest. And I'm Mike Champney, a private practice general surgeon in Atlanta. Uh, this is the parallel plenary session eight. So if you're looking for seven, you may be in the wrong room. Uh, and we'll start. Our first paper is novel preoperative patient survey predicts adverse patient outcomes, implementation, and preliminary results of the Tennessee perioperative assessment tool or TPAT uh, to be presented by Dr. McLaughlin. All right, good morning, and uh, I want to thank the Southeastern Surgical Congress and the moderators for the privilege of presenting our work. It actually took quite a bit of time to come up with the title, so TPAT is what we settled with. Uh, ultimately, this project began as a uh, evaluation of our own institutional data. Uh, it's a little bit busy, but basically uh, from our own institutional uh, Findings, we noted an observed to expected ratio of inpatient mortality from elected elective surgery to be higher than we wanted. Uh, clearly, over one is not good. And our organizational uh, long-term goals was to push that number closer to 0 0.5. Uh, so that became the foundation of our uh, thought process and uh, uh, data review. So we began this process by a retrospective review of this data, and we noted three distinct groups. Uh, the first were those that uh, uh, were low risk for the proposed surgery. Number two were those that were high risk, and you can see those on each side of the graph. And then there uh, really was a middle group that had the potential uh, for modifiable risk factors. This middle, middle group often had documented comorbidities, but no interventions recommended, or the provider did not recognize in real time that the patient would have benefit, benefited from prehabilitation. So our goal was to create a pathway to help encourage what we called a thoughtful pause uh, from the provider prior to scheduling an inpatient elective surgery. One of our authors had separately worked to create a functional status questionnaire. It was a four-question uh, four questionnaire uh, focusing exclusively on functional status. We absorbed those four questions and then added 10 more questions that were uh, elucidated from our internal data. And really we were focusing on uh, the functional performance status. So that's basically how much uh, a person does just on a day-to-day -day basis. We then looked at functional capacity, which was their peak performance, and then uh, focusing on functional decline. And then uh, we added in other topics, including tobacco use, uh, diabetes management, and uh, social network support. Just to highlight uh, the first portion of the questionnaire, again, highlighted uh, you know, both the baseline daily activities, which again, we refer to as the functional performance status, as well as the peak performance or their functional capacity. <laughs> These questions were self-reported. So this came uh, directly from the uh, patients themselves. And this questionnaire was completed prior to the visit with the surgeon. The results were blinded from the surgeon in regards to surgical planning. 
it's a lot to see and hopefully you can see it from the back, but again, uh, based on comorbidities and patient reported symptoms. A total of 1,950 questionnaires were completed prospectively. Of those, 115 were deemed to be too comorbid for surgery. 370 were referred for other medical or neoadjuvant therapies. 1,268 uh, underwent elective outpatient surgery as defined as an inpatient hospital stay less than 48 hours. And at the end of the study, 197 fit the inclusion criteria and are the basis for our upcoming results. The two most important predictors of poor outcomes were first of all, a self-reported decline of fun or functional decline in activity in the prior 60 days to the surgery scheduled. This single question best predicted readmission rates, wound infection, wound dehiscence, sepsis, and a need for blood transfusions. Number two was the use of cigarettes in the last 60 days. This finding is certainly not unexpected. And I guess just to highlight that the self-reported continued use of tobacco had a higher rate of pneumonia and trends towards other pulmonary complications. Some other findings of interest, and I'll try to make sense of these from top to bottom. Those that reported a functional capacity that did not exceed their daily performance, meaning that their best day was the same as every other day, had increased incidence of AKIs. Those with recent surgical procedures or a recent ER admission had increased transfusion requirements. Those with unintentional weight loss were at increased risk for developing sepsis. And those with less than optimal control of their diabetes, as we defined as a hemoglobin A1C greater than seven, at higher rates of blood transfusions. And those with shortness of breath with activity or separately at rest had also increased rates of blood transfusions and AKIs. So in conclusion, this Tennessee preoperative assessment tool is an easily administered tool to potential surgical candidates. Uh, again, this was given uh, prior to the surgical visit, it's self-reported and no additional equipment or personnel was needed. We found that a self-reported functional decline in daily activities was associated with several important post-operative outcomes. This tool will certainly need further verification, but may serve to highlight patients in the office setting that would benefit from a thoughtful pause and emphasis on prehabilitation. Thank you. Be happy to answer any questions. Um, so I'll start off. Um, has this, the, the very basic one, has this changed what you do in the office? And so if you, I, I guess, at that visit, are you sitting down with that at the same time with the patient or is this a post hoc uh, sort of like we need to get them back in and maybe not delay that surgery, just put on the schedule? Right. So uh, and initially it was kept blinded and uh, uh, we realized the power of it. And so uh, it now accompanies the patient to the surgeon visit and the surgeon now has a uh, opportunity to review it. Our next iteration is that we've added on two more questions that the surgeon fills out. Uh, to determine whether or not that result impacted their surgical decision. So we'll hopefully by next year be able to present that update. Dr. Cornwell. Hi, Eddie Cornwell, Washington, D.C., Dr. McLaughlin. That's, that's, that's great, a great concept, <clears throat> great work, well presented. I'm excited for what comes from here. A couple of questions along that line. You had, you laid out in one of your slides uh, how you worked your way down to the, I think, 197 it ultimately had the elective operation. There's a neoadjuvant neo -adjuvant or other therapy group in there, 300 something, I think it was. Did any of those patients subsequently go on to surgery after their neoadjuvant, number one? Number two would be, uh, how many surgeons were participating and were there others in the larger group uh, that were not participating in this? And do you see it growing? Um, and three, how do you deal with uh, the loss, this functional scale, I like TPAT, this, this functional performance scale uh, that, is, that has taken a, that has decreased because of the surgical disease, a, a non-obstructive colon lesion, partially obstructing a patient who's getting smaller caliber stools, not eating quite as much, visceral proteins may be going down over the last two, three months and that sort of thing. How do you 
take that into account. But congratulations on the concept. You know, okay. I hope you bring further work on it. I'm plan I hope so as well. Thank you. So uh, it it uh, ultimately was a general surgery, uh, a Department of Surgery initiative. Uh, it, it started shortly after COVID, and uh, uh, what we found pretty dramatically is that most uh, previously categorized inpatient care transitioned to outpatient. So uh, the uh, much of our vascular surgery uh, team members, general surgery, uh, most of those patients did not qualify, uh, at least based on Medicare definition of, of an inpatient care. Uh, ultimately, the majority of the cases were surgical oncology and colorectal. And uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, neoadjuvant treated patients uh, did circle back and were reevaluated. Uh, so the way we thought about those is uh, uh, the at the time of the questionnaire, uh, we just did not even evaluate them. So that uh, they may have already uh, documented several health declines. We just took those out of the mix and focused on the questionnaire when they did come back for surgery. I couldn't tell you how many circled back around uh, less than that 300, but probably more than probably more than two thirds eventually made it to surgery. And the uh, I got those two. The third one. Uh, how did you deal with if the decrease in functional ability was due to the lesion itself uh, that perhaps may may help them? You're showing that if it was increased, greater incidence of lot more complication pneumonia. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, yeah, the thought process on those again. This was just a prospective following of the questionnaire. And uh, uh, the next step is going to uh, determine action based on those results, where we hopefully determine uh, the time frame to intervene on some. Uh, again, to your points, a lot of the uh, folks have partial bowel obstructions for various tumor reasons, and the ability to pause for two or three months is not going to starve to death before that. And uh, the, the hope is to learn from that and to influence our prehabilitation model. And uh, I don't have the answer for that yet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McCullough. We're going to move to our next presentation, Management of Penetrating Cardiac Injuries with Pericardial Window Lavage and Drainage in Select Patients, presented by Dr. Zarkowski from the University of Tennessee Medical Center at Memphis. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Zarkowski. I'm a second year trauma fellow at uh, UT Memphis, and uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present here today. I will be talking about the uh, management of penetrating cardiac injuries uh, with pericardial uh, window and drainage in select patients. Oh, yeah. This. Okay. Uh, I have no disclosures. Um, so pen penetrating cardiac trauma is uh, highly lethal and it poses a, a great challenge to trauma surgeons. Um, about 10%, of, only 10% of patients survived to the hospital. It's extremely rare, represents about 0.16% uh, of all trauma admissions. Um, and those that do survive to reach the hospital, they require rapid assessment, diagnosis, and intervention. Uh, tamponade, shock, and cardiopulmonary arrest can occur even in patients that uh, present hemodynamically stable. Um, so uh, when someone comes in with a high suspicion of cardiac injury, um, we first want to start with a fast, um, if it's equivocal or if it's negative. Um, but again, if you have a high suspicion, then you want to proceed to a window. Um, however, blood found during that window usually always mandated a sternotomy, but there's uh, significant morbidity and costs associated with that procedure. Um, there's been recent literature, um, albeit sparse literature, that says that stable patients can undergo uh, window lavage and drainage instead of a sternotomy, and um, that's what our study aimed to find. Um, so we looked at patients that suffered uh, penetrating chest trauma and uh, who underwent a window and or sternotomy from 2017 to 2021. Uh, it was retrospectively reviewed, and uh, we looked at charts um, that uh, compared patient demographics, injury severity, 
timed operation, imagery findings, indication for operation, and operative interventions. Um, these patients were then stratified by uh, operative intervention and compared. So they were either a pericardial window and sternotomy or a pericardial window, lavage, and drainage. Uh, the uh, outcomes we measured were mortality, length of stay, ICU length of stay, ventilator days, and complications. Um, and then these comparisons were made using students' T-tests, chi-score analysis, will Cox and Rank sum or Fisher's exact test when appropriate. And then we did stepwise multivariable logistic regression analysis uh, to determine independent predictors of sternotomy. Um, so out of 126 patients that got a window, 74% of those uh, we did with a sub xiphoid approach, 17% with a trans diaphragmatic approach, and then 9% with an intercostal approach. Um, so what we found was that our FAST was 93% sensitive, 21% uh, specific, and had a 79% positive predictive value. Um, in addition, seven patients with a left hemothorax um, and a negative FAST ended up having a positive window um, that mandated a sternotomy and repair. Um, so um, as you can see, oh, sorry, the boxes aren't where they should be. Um, uh, patients that had a window in sternotomy had a much higher ISS uh, and base excess compared to the window lavage and drainage group. Um, and as you can see, the time to operative inter intervention was much quicker in the um, uh, sternotomy group, um, but uh, ICU uh, length of stay, length of stay in general, then or later days of mortality were all uh, similar with the um, uh, st st uh, uh, insignificant uh, p-values. Um, for the cardiac injuries, the right ventricle was the uh, most commonly injured part of the heart. And then uh, what we found is that ISS is an independent predictor of therapeutic sternotomy. Uh, and then we proved this with an odds ratio of 1.16, 95% confidence interval and a p-value of 0.006. Um, so in conclusion, our, our FAST was sensitive, but it lacked specificity. Um, this was likely a result of the number of patients with a negative FAST, um, but who had a left hemothorax um, and a true cardiac injury. Um, pneumomediastinum and, and left hemothorax are your biggest um, reasons for having a false negative. Um, a majority of our windows were used with the sub xiphoid approach. Um, and while the diagnostic yield, yield of a window has been known for some time, the therapeutic management with window lavage and drainage has only recently been reported in the literature. Um, so what we found is that uh, penetrating cardiac injury can be managed with window lavage and drainage in select patients. Um, positive FAST significant findings on CT imaging and um, trajectory of wounds do not necessarily mandate a sternotomy. Um, however, a negative FAST in the setting of the left hemothorax does not rule one out and should uh, be investigated further. Thank you. We'll take any questions. Jay Collins from Norfolk, Virginia. Very interesting study. So obviously that's heresy, you know, to a lot of us in here. I, I wonder if you can give us a little more detail on who you decide to do a window and lavage. Obviously, there's a lot longer time. So these folks are, I'm assuming, hemodynamically normal and you're you know, suspicious they don't have an injury. Um, why, is, you know, why is their window fast? What are they bleeding from? <clears throat> and then how are you following these patients up long term you know, with echocardiography or you know, have you seen these folks, you know, three months out or any of them de developing, you know, ventricular aneurysms or things like that, that have maybe walled off initially, but as time goes on, they've got a ticking, you know, ticking time bomb. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the issues with the study was that um, with it being retrospective, it was very operator dependent in terms of who got a window and who got a sternotomy. Um, a lot of the times that our institution will lavage until it's clear, and if the patient's stable, then those were the patients that did not proceed to a sternotomy. Um, we do not have a protocolized approach to it as of now. Um, so again, it's very operator dependent. Um, in terms of post-op care, um, we have not seen these patients three, six months with an echo. However, 
in doing this study. That's kind of our um, goal in the future is to develop kind of a post-op protocol, which would include echo and cardiac monitoring. Eddie Cornwell, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's going to take a lot to push push some of us uh, back. So let me ask you a few questions. And congratulations on your work. Um, the first is, were these all stab wounds? No, they were stab and gunshot wounds. You know, what what percentage? Uh, majority it? were stab wounds. Yeah. I think some. I'm assuming the overwhelming majority are stab wounds. Yeah. You don't have many gunshots to the heart that do well with selective non-operative management. So this, the second thing is, um, your window was done three routes. Correct. Transthoracic, subdiaphragmatic. Uh, so it's quite possible, technique-wise, that what you're calling a positive window, since you traversed the pleural space in some patients that had a hemothorax, may have been a negative, may not have had a cardiac injury at, at all. Is that possible? It's possible. And that's what, I mean, uh, you know, there's a couple of papers out there. I think one by Harris out of South Africa and Nickel. Um, who in their studies have found that some of these lacerations will self-seal or they have a ten tangential injury. And that's why sometimes you can get away with doing just a window and lavage. I got a, I, I got a story about that. And I'll tell you last, but I, one other question, which is what happened? Were there any people in the uh, positive window lavage group who then failed that non-sternotomy pr approach and then subsequently had to go because of hemodynamic uh, instability? had to go on to sternotomy? No, there was one patient that had a recurrent effusion that went back just for a window and drainage or a re-window and drainage. Um, one of the sternotomy patients had a, a wound dehiscence um, and those were really the only complications. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting old, but not too dogmatic to change, although I need convincing. I, I co-authored and during my days at USC, one of the largest series on penetrating heart injuries and then took that with me to Baltimore, to Hopkins. And one day, early July, I had a 15-year-old who got stabbed with an ice pick. He was tender in his upper abdomen. We did a uh, laparotomy. He had a minimally bleeding liver laceration, but it was clear that the thing also pierced uh, the pericardial surface of the diaphragm. So from the, from the surface, we did a transdiaphragmatic window, which was positive. In my hands, positive mandated sternotomy. We did a sternotomy, and in fact, he did have a non-bleeding little pinpoint perforation of the right ventricle. It wasn't bleeding. In my experience, and it had been a lot, I didn't know the natural history of a non-bleeding, so I was unaware. So we put a pledge of suture over it and called it a heart repair of this non-bleeding cardiac injury. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd be afraid not to do it today, although you're pushing me a little bit, not quite. But the, I think the one thing we're missing is what we don't have the absolute final arbiter of what those injuries were, whether they were, in fact, uh, ventricular injuries as opposed to some pericardial hemorrhage or something that traversed from the pleural space right into the mediastinum. Thanks for, your, for raising my inquisition, though. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next paper is Profile Outcomes of Prostate Malignancy Among Patients Younger Than 50 Years, presented by Dr. Akinyemi from Howard University. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present findings from our study. Uh, my name is Oluwa Shegmu Akinyemi. we have no disclosures. Um, prostate cancer is uh, one of the commonest uh, malignancies among American men. And it's also the common, is the second lead, uh, leading cause of uh, cancer specific mortality uh, in these men. And usually it occurs among older men with uh, an average age of uh, 66 years. The natural history of this disease has been understudied in, uh, among young men in the United States. The objective of the present study is to determine the profile and also outcomes of patients uh, who develop prostate cancer age 50 and below. And to do this, we actually conducted a retrospective analysis uh, using the National Cancer Database uh, spanning from January 2004 to December 2018, we compared overall survivor 
uh, between young patients who were defined as patients whose age at diagnosis was 50 or below, and a control group of um, patients with prostate cancer whose age were above the age of 50. Um, here, we, at the inception of the study, we have about 840,000 uh, patients with primary uh, prostate malignancies, and about 6.3% of these patients, about that's translated to about 52,000, were diagnosed at the age of 50 or below. And uh, looking at this uh, uh, table, you see uh, black patients are represented by the red, uh, while the white patients are represented by the blue. And overall, in the total population, we have about 81.3% of whites, while they were about 14.2% of blacks. But when we focus at men who were diagnosed at the age of 50 or below, we found out that 21% of these patients uh, were blacks, showing an overrepresentation of blacks in this uh, particular uh, age group. We went ahead to conduct a Cox regression where we try to determine uh, the factors that are associated with uh, a survivor among the whole group. And we adjusted the model for, but we adjusted for the disease stage representation. We adjusted for social determinant of health, such as patient education level, insurance type, and income. And we adjusted for pre-existing comorbidities using the Charleston comorbidity index and treatment modality. We, in this uh, analysis, our reference group are white uh, patients, uh, black patients, sorry, black patients who are below the, who are diagnosed at the age of 50 or below, why, and that is represented by the vertical green line. If you look at this, where we compare black patients who are diagnosed at the age of 50 and uh, at the age of uh, age that is greater than 50 to the reference point, we found out that outcomes, the survivor is worse with black patient diagnosed after the age of 50. Uh, we can also say this for whites, whites who are diagnosed at the age of, uh, at the age greater than 50 also has a worse outcome when compared to our reference group. However, when we compare uh, black patients diagnosed at the age of 50 or below and white patients diagnosed at the age of 50 or below, there was no uh, difference in the survivor, showing that there is no risk disparity among patients with prostate cancer when diagnosed at the age of 50 or below. In conclusion, uh, patients with prostate cancer age 50 and below have better overall survivor when compared to their older counterparts. And black patients are overrepresented among young prostate cancer patients. And this may be a point that can be used to benefit. This, patient, this particular group of patients may benefit from an earlier screening. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Good morning, Jim McLaughlin from UT Knoxville. Uh, thank you for this talk. This is an area that uh, I think raises a lot of questions just in regardless of what you manage in surgery, uh, figuring out how to interpret prostate cancer and what it means long-term is, uh, is really a daily challenge. Through the NCDB, are you able to uh, discern down to the Gleason score? Does that, I don't know the database that well enough to know. Uh, yes. Uh, as, okay. Is yes. It, Often, if it's a, you know, when we have urologists at tumor conference, a low Gleason score, we tend to prioritize uh, whatever other uh, malignancy we're dealing with. But uh, uh, how how did that interpret? How did that in, uh, impact the interpretation of your results? I guess. Yeah. Thank you for the question. We actually, in the National Cancer Database, we are able to account for the Gleason score, and we actually accounted for this in our analysis. We use both the disease staging. We use the Gleason score. And we use the uh, prostate stat, uh, PSA value. And I, even after we included this in our models, that was when we got this result that we found. So we accounted for those very important variables. Very good talk. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to the prevalence and predictors of long-term opioid use after pelvic fractures, presenting by Nicole Ann Villa. 
from Drexel University College of Medicine. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Villa. I'm a second year medical student at Drexel University. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Southeastern Surgical Congress for the opportunity to present our research here today. We have nothing to disclose on the research that will be presented. For some background on our study, in 2017, over 70,000 drug overdose deaths were reported in the United States, where about 70% of these deaths were attributed to opioid use. In addition, we know that up to 20% of orthopedic trauma patients go on to seek prescription analgesia from more than one provider following discharge. In the context of patients who have pelvic injuries, they're known to have a high incidence of chronic pain where opioids have been utilized as the first line treatment for their pain medication or pain management for the past several decades, despite the lack of current evidence for its long-term effectiveness. Because of this, the objective of our study is to evaluate the prevalence and risk factors for long-term opioid use following pelvic fractures, where we hypothesize that there is an association between the amount of inpatient opioid use and long-term opioid use after discharge in patients who have pelvic fractures. And so our study was performed retrospectively with adult patients who were admitted to the hospital with pelvic fractures um, to over a five-year period. We had 277 participants after excluding those who were either transferred to a different facility or passed away before discharge. The patient's pelvic fractures were then classified using the tile system, where type A signifies a stable pelvic fracture, type B a rotationally unstable pelvic fracture, and type, B, and type C a rotationally and vertically unstable pelvic fracture. We looked at a number of outcomes where a primary outcome was defined as long-term opioid use or patients using opioids 60 to 90 days after discharge. And our secondary outcome was looking at intermediate term opioid use or patients using opioids 30 to 60 days after discharge. We then calculated the daily and the total morphine milligram equivalents or MME of opioids that patients received during admission as well as three months post discharge in one month intervals. Based on those calculations, we divided our patient population to two different groups, those who received low doses of opioids or less than 50 MME per inpatient day, or high doses, which is greater than or equal to 50 MME per inpatient day. Univariable and logistic regression analyses were then utilized um, based on the data that we collected. From our analysis, we found that the median age of our patient population was 43, with 4% having a history of opioid use. In addition, we found that 16% of patients had type B or type C pelvic fractures. In addition, we found that 16% of our patient population can be classified under long-term opioid use, while 29% had intermediate-term opioid use. Through our univariable analysis, we found that receiving high doses of opioids during admission was significantly associated with both intermediate and long-term opioid use. In addition, history of substance abuse excluding opioids, type B or C pelvic fractures, the injury severity score, and the need for operative management for those pelvic fractures were all associated with both outcomes. On the other hand, age, gender, and pre-injury opioid use were not associated with either outcomes. Through our logistic regression analysis, we were able to, to, to determine two factors that can be utilized as independent predictors for long-term opioid use one of which was receiving high doses of opioids during admission of greater than or equal to 50 MME per inpatient day, and second being having either type B or type C pelvic fractures. Our study did have a few limitations, one of which that patient-controlled analgesia pumps and intravenous infusions of opioids had to be estimated based on data collected from the EMR. Secondly, opioid prescriptions obtained from the PDMP or EMR programs had to be utilized as proxies for actual actual opioid use used post-discharge as we could not estimate it after the patients were discharged from the hospital. In conclusion, we found that patients receiving high daily opioid doses during admission and having complex pelvic fractures can be utilized as independent predictors of long-term opioid use for patients with pelvic fractures. We believe that this is important as identifying the prevalence and risk factors for long-term opioid use is vital for informing clinical management in order to prevent adverse outcomes in patients who have pelvic fractures. Thank you for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So congratulations, very well presented. Um, has 
your study impacted your trauma, I guess your trauma center, your orthopedic trauma center's management of pelvic fractures or as a multimodal non-narcotic uh, pain uh, management system been implemented or, or, or in addition to, do you provide counseling to these people that they're at risk for this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, as of now, I'm not aware of any changes in as of the moment, but our the trauma department has been aware that we've been um, doing this study and this study is in collaboration with the trauma department. So we recently finished our analysis and we hope that there will be changes made in terms of um, how these patients are managed when they're given opioids for pain management after discharge. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next paper is evaluating the efficacy of the surgical consent by Dr. Delgado from Advent Health Orlando. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Delgado, and I'm here to present my project title, Evaluating the Efficacy of Surgical Consent. So the aim of our project was to further scrutinize our consenting process. The aim of consent, of course, is to abide by medical ethics and particularly patient autonomy. But how do we know that we're doing that? A lot of times patients are too nervous to ask questions. They don't know what they don't know. And there's, a, there's language barriers that get in the way from them asking questions. So this is what we wanted to further elucidate with our study. We chose three of the most standardized outpatient procedures, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, an opening guinea hernia repair, and soft tissue mass excisions. We would consent them in the standard verbal manner and have them sign the consent document. During that same presentation, we would then uh, administer a survey with six free response boxes where they were able to, where we asked them to fill out three risks, two benefits, and one alternative. We then determined that if the patient were, was, were able to name five or greater of these free responses, that we would, they would have adequate understanding of the procedure they were signing up for. So in total, there were 73 responses, but only 62 completed enough of it to be able to use the data for our study. So when we were analyzing our results, most of them were able to answer bleeding, infection, et cetera, but we were most, mostly interested in whether they could recognize the risk benefits and alternatives that were pertinent to that particular case. So for example, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, they were able to identify bile duct injury and even a minority identified cro uh, chronic diarrhea with an alternative being uh, dietary changes. For an opening renal hernia repair, they were able to identify a recurrence as one of the risks or non-operative management as the alternative. And then soft tissue excisions, uh, whether damage to nerves or buildup of fluids such as a seroma and the alternative of watchful waiting. So what did our results show? Overall, hernias with hernias, there was a 55% adequate understanding based on our standard. For a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, about a 42%, and for a soft tissue mass excision, 40%, with an overall adequate understanding based on our standard of 45%. When you compare them, uh, uh, to each other, there was no statistical significance between them. So, where, uh, so where could you? We, uh, excuse me. So we were encouraged that the patients were able to identify the most uh, most pertinent risk benefits and alternatives for these uh, for these cases, but we were still below the fiftieth percentile in adequate understanding based on where we want to be. So possible shortcomings uh, based on the literature. Uh, some articles mentioned that when junior residents or advanced practice providers do the consent, they may not have the grasp on the procedure or the knowledge of the technical nuances because they just haven't done it or seen it enough. If they're not able to have the grasp uh, necessary to simplify the procedure, it may, may, they may use complex medical jargon that further compounds the confusion between patients. Um, we also have to look at ourselves and our implicit bias. Uh, certain studies suggest that we tend to overestimate how much information we've given, overestimate the risks, and underestimate how much the how much information the patient wants to receive. 
So what are the opportunities for improvement? First, as it is in our practice to have a surgical attending present during the consent process, because one, they understand those nuances that patients may not be able to answer. And two, um, they're forming that bond with the patient that is ultimately their patient. Um, second, another, another idea is using a checklist. And when using a checklist, uh, the consent process becomes root, uh, a routine, less likely for you to miss anything when doing the consent. If it's also a, a physical checklist, it's something you can give to the patient and something they can refer to in the future and go back to if they have any questions and look up. And finally, it's the use of technology, multimedia, PowerPoints, uh, animations, anything that can uh, enhance comprehension for the patient. There is a systematic review of 33 articles that evaluated the use of multimedia during the consent process. Um, and it showed a statistically significant increase in comprehension and statistically significant decrease in overall anxiety produced by the procedure. So in conclusion, again, we're encouraged that we're able to get across the most uh, pertinent alternative risk benefits, but we have a lot of room for improvement and we have the responsibility to do so. This sets us up nicely for a project going forward where we hope to administer some of these tools and then follow up with the results and hopefully tell you guys about it next year. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so you said this survey was administered right after the consent process was done? Yes, sir. In the meantime, while they were setting up the scheduling and whatnot, we gave them the consent to fill it out. Were you able to identify those patients that failed the survey? And was there any attempt made to go back through the consent process with them a second time? No, sir. Per the IRB protocol, they were de-identified. Okay. Was so language matters and level of uh, language. It should usually, I think, be somewhere around the eighth grade for the text. Um, and so, and with electronic health records, uh, many of us have our own templated kind of consent. Was mm -hmm. the consent the same? Uh, the wording the same? If uh, and um, was it standardized in any way? No, because of you know the nature of our rotations, uh, every resident rotates differently from month to month. So there was no particular way to standardize it. Every resident is trained in the common risk benefits and alternatives, of course, of these procedures, but there is no way to standardize that delivery other than the constant being the attending, of course, that would back up the, the consent process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move to differences in post-operative outcomes and perioperative resource utilization between general surgeons and pediatric surgeons, a systematic review and meta-analysis presented by Ali Eeks from the University of North Carolina. Hi, I would like to thank the Southeastern Surgical Congress for allowing me to share our results with you today. My name is Ali. I'm a fourth-year medical student from UNC Chapel Hill, and today I'll be talking about the differences in post-operative outcomes and perioperative resource utilization between uh, general surgeons and pediatric surgeons as systematic review. Oh, sorry. There we go. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so it's well established that pediatric appendectomies are the most common procedure formed in this patient performed in this patient population. Our research group has previously analyzed the proportion of each of these subgroups being general surgeons and pediatric surgeons that perform this procedure in patients in North Carolina. We found that pediatric surgeons perform 44.6% of these procedures and that general surgeons perform 32.5. So both of these uh, surgeon subgroups perform a significant proportion of these uh, procedures in our patient population. And we also found that the general surgery sub subgroup was associated with higher charges. Um, using a systematic review, it's one way to look at inter, inter surgeon differences to identify potential quality improvement um, procedures in order to ensure that we're delivering high quality care in an efficient manner to our patients. Um, so we, given that previous systematic reviews have been performed, there have been multiple um, papers that have been published since the last one was performed and also including a variety of new outcomes such as opioid utilization. So we wanted to use this study to not only look at intersurgeon differences, but also to identify potential quality improvement efforts that we can use to um, improve care for pediatric patients. So for our methods, we performed a systematic review using the PubMed database. 
From 1990 to 2022, we defined our pediatric patients as those less than 18 year old that underwent appendectomy. We included a variety of outcomes, including but not limited to length of stay, negative appendectomy rate, readmission within 30 days, and complication rates. And all of our studies that we included needed to include some comparison between general surgeons and pediatric surgeons. For general surgeons, this could be general surgeons, but also general surgery residents and trauma and acute care surgeons, because all of these patient subgroups, all these surgeon subgroups perform this um, procedure at a significant rate. Looking at our results, you can see our Prisma flow diagram here and our initial search strategy yielded 4,799 articles. Using our inclusion and exclusion, exclusion criteria, we ultimately included 16 articles in our analysis. Um, and you can see the table here, um, the variety of outcomes that were reported and the number of studies reporting each outcome with the most commonly reported outcomes being length of stay, readmission within 30 rates, the negative appendectomy rate, and wound infections or surgical site infections. Those highlighted in the red box, these seven outcomes, we were able to perform a meta-analysis given that there was consistently in how, the consistency in how these outcomes were reported, but also the availability of the data um, from our included studies. When looking at our outcomes, the only statistically significant difference between general surgeons and pediatric surgeons was in the negative appendectomy rate with patients, with pediatric patients having a negative uh, appendectomy performed by general surgeon associated with 1.47 times the risk of having a negative appendectomy as compared to those performed by pediatric surgeons. We found no other difference in our meta-analyses looking at the results highlighted on the previous slide. So in conclusion, we found that general surgeons do have a higher rate of negative appendectomies, but we found no difference in 30-day readmissions, wound infections, perioperative imaging use, laparoscopic technique, or complications. For future studies, we recommend um, analyzing other common procedures between these two subgroups to identify potential quality improvement efforts so we can ensure high-quality care is being delivered to our pediatric patients. Thank you, and I'll happily take any questions. Do you have a hypothesis as to why general surgeons had a higher negative appendectomy rate? Um, I think that uh, given that they're usually performed at community hospitals, they may have less um, pe pediatric focused radiology, um, which may lead them to um, operate at a, a higher rate if have a higher um, index of suspicion for appendectomy, for needing an appendectomy for pediatric patients. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next paper is Critical View of Safety Plus, Improving the Safety of Laparoscopical Sectomy with Indesign in Green, uh, presented by Dr. Stoltz from Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Souls. I'm a PGY-4 at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Thank you to Southeastern Surgical for allowing me this podium. Um, today, I'll be presenting to you our data um, from improving the safety of laparoscopic cholecystectomy using indocyanine green dye using the critical view of safety plus. Um, I have no disclosures um, at this time. So uh, today we'll kind of go over a little bit of our background, redefine the critical view of safety, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, and then define the critical view of safety plus. Um, we'll discuss some of the baseline characteristics, go over our methods or results, and then our recommendations. So background, um, bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy has an incidence of about 0.2% to 0.5%. A bile duct injury has a significant uh, weight on healthcare cost with costs upwards of $100,000. Um, this was uh, a study presented in 2008. So obviously with inflation, that is much larger um, today. Um, the, another study kind of looked into what is the reason for these bile duct injuries. Um, it was a meta-analysis and it concluded that visual perception uh, perceptional illusion actually led to the primary cause in 97% of all bile duct injuries. So indocyanine green, um, what is it? It's something we use, it's injected intravenously. Um, it has properties that allow for 
fluoroscopic angiography, um, and also um, how we use it in laparoscopic cholecystectomies is that it has a hepatic clearance, um, and it is uh, cleared with half-life of 150 to 180 seconds, um, which allows it to build up in our hepatic system and clearance through the bile ducts into the duodenum. Um, this allows us to identify the biliary system, aberrant biliary anatomy, um, using ICG fluoroscopic devices. Um, so the critical view of safety. Uh, everyone has heard this many times. Um, Sages has a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful presentation on this in their website. Um, but the critical view safety includes uh, identifying the fatocystic triangle cleared of fat and fibrous tissue, the lower third of the gallbladder being separated from the liver to expose the cystic plate, and then only two structures entering the gallbladder. So what is the critical view of safety plus? This is what we are presenting is um, something as an additive to the critical view of safety. It's using uh, ICG fluoroscopy to visualize your critical view of safety. So it's obtaining your critical view of safety as you would normally in your laparoscopic cholecystectomy or cholecystectomy, but then also using ICG fluoroscopy. Um, so this is a single center prospective study. Um, we had two operative surgeons, one a general surgeon in our practice, and then on one of our trauma and acute care surgery uh, surgeons, uh, and then a single control surgeon. Uh, the females were a majority of our patients, 72%, and males, 28%. Non-Hispanic whites made up 76% of our patients, um, with 24% being Hispanic or Latino, Latina origin. Average age was 49. Um, our inclusion criteria was being an adult over 18, over equal to 18, and then undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy by one of these two surgeons. Uh, exclusion would be pregnancy uh, due to risk of uh, teratogenic effects uh, that are not fully uh, elucidated, uh, and then allergy to the dye or iodine, because it is an iodinated uh, endocyanine. Um, the, our 50 patients are the first 25 from each surgeon. Um, the diagnosis requiring this laparoscopic cholecystectomy was cholecystitis in 50%, symptomatic cholelithiasis in 17%, and biliary dyskinesia in uh, 16%. So um, in conjunction with pre-op antibiotics, uh, 2.5 milligrams of ICG dye were administered to the patient intravenously. Uh, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy was performed per surgeon preference um, to obtain the critical view of safety. At that point, the operative surgeon took a photo of the critical view of safety, and then also proceeded to take a photo of the critical view of safety plus using the ICG fluoroscopy. Um, completion of the surgery was per surgeon preference, and then images were graded uh, sequentially by the grading surgeon. This is our, uh, uh, how we measured the critical view of safety and the critical view of safety plus. Um, with a max score of six and a minimum score of zero, which actually did happen. So the critical view of safety photo was given to our control surgeon and PowerPoint slide sequentially. Um, she graded that photo and then was asked four questions. Would she cut, aka proceed with the procedure? Would she do further dissection to expose the cystic plate, the cystic artery, or the cystic duct? And then the next slide would show the exact same uh, patient, with the critical view of safety plus and graded in the same manner. Here's just a photo showing the same uh, operative dissection in critical view of safety and safety plus. So our results, um, our mean in critical view of safety was 4.04 and plus in 4.36. Um, this was uh, not significant with p-value of 0 0.7. And then this is our chi-squared analysis of that secondary question, um, showing that with critical view of safety plus the green bars, there was a significant increase in decision to proceed with surgery, uh, proceed with the procedure clipping and cutting and uh, finishing 
with the use of critical view of safety plus. There is also uh, notably decreased responses for isolation of the cystic duct. Um, so recommendations, uh, we recommend routine use of ICG fluoroscopy to evaluate the critical view of safety plus uh, in our laparoscopical cystectomies uh, for the reasons listed below. Thank you. Were the surgeons trained, uh, educated in critical view of safety uh, prior to initiation of the study? So did they do cholecystectomies, take pictures? Were they graded with, and was there follow-up with their education so that they knew the uh, sort of tenets of it? Yes, so um, there was no formal education on critical view of safety, uh, but the uh, surgeons were provided with the scoring criteria uh, before the initiation of this project. Um, so they knew exactly what would get them a zero and what would get them a six. Uh, as well, the um, with the endocyte and green group, the safety plus, there was more dissection recommended for the cystic artery. Do you think the endocyte and green biased uh, either the surgeon or the uh, reviewer as for focus on the bile duct and not necessarily the bile duct and artery? Because uh, that was sort of perplexing me why more dissection would be needed on the artery. Um, so in the two groups, operative surgeons, um, there's a significant difference in the, uh, not all gallbladders are the same. Um, so some of the dissection groups uh, there were two within the subgroup that actually did score a zero. So I think that that may have played a role in it. Um, and, uh, and lastly, did you uh, ever have an instance of uh, the endocyte and green not uh, filling the cystic duct or the gallbladder because of obstruction with the acute cholecystitis? Yes, and that is one um, problem with this. The Filling does have to occur. So if you have complete obstruction of the cystic duct, um, you will have difficulty visualizing the cystic duct, but um, you will still continue to see the common hepatic common. Um, Did any of these patients have intraoperative cholangiogram or were they excluded? Um, these, there was no, I did not uh, subdivide based on that. Um, I, uh, IOC was performed as indicated, um, and this was pre-performing of that. So um, that's why I did not divide them out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation will be the role of preoperative magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography slash endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography in the setting of mildly elevated liver enzymes prior to cholecystectomy, presented by Rachel, Dr. Rachel Groning from Grand Strand Medical Center. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Groening. I'm from Grand... Perfect. Thank you again for this opportunity to present our research today. Today, I'm going to be talking about the um, indication for preoperative imaging prior to a, a cholecystectomy in patients with mildly elevated LFTs. No financial disclosures. So as we know, as a patient presents with acute cholecystitis, they most commonly present with elevated LFTs. And so then we're faced with the question of whether or not we need preoperative imaging in these patients to determine if there's any stones or cholecystitis. This study evaluated the role of obtaining these imaging studies prior to a cholecystectomy in patients with specifically mildly elevated LFTs with a T-bili between two and four. So how we did this was we took patients from 18 to 80 years old undergoing an inpatient cholecystectomy with an abnormally elevated total bilirubin between the years of 2014 and 2021. Patients with bilirubin greater than four were excluded from this study. 
presence of cholelithiasis was confirmed via analysis of an ERCP, either the stone was identified or extracted. We used a multivariant variant logistic regression and with an additive and an interac interaction model. So we had about 4,434 patients from these encounters. Both ERCP and MRCP were predictive of the presence of cholelithiasis with an odd ra odds ratio of 3.23. Mildly elevated T. bilirubin was not found to increase the odds of cholelithiasis in these patients with either the additive model of one point with an odds ratio of 1.2 or an interaction model of 1.18. So here's our, our numbers on a chart. So in conclusion, uh, patients with mildly elevated bilirubin levels between two and four was not sufficient indication for stones being present in the ductal system and requiring an MRCP or an ERCP. So we feel that it's not routine to perform these imaging studies prior to a patient undergoing a cholecystectomy with mildly elevated bilirubin levels. I will open the floor to any questions. Please, please come to the microphone, state your name and your question. So uh, how mildly elevated are you talking about? Because um, uh, TBL greater than 4.0 is an indication from the uh, American College of uh, Gastrointestinal uh, Physicians for so ERCP. ERCP. Exactly. So we're talking between two and four. So obviously the patients that had a TBL greater than four were excluded from this study because like you said, under the, under those standards, those patients would benefit from an ERCP because they most likely have some type of stone in their dot or cholelithiasis. I think you sort of get into a, the holy war about who's managing the bile duct here. Mm -hmm. uh, my institution would argue to do neither of those tests preoperatively mm -hmm. and to just do an interoperative clandrogram and clear the duct if needed, mm -hmm. which would be probably, uh, I think it's been shown to be the most cost-effective route. Mm -hmm. Now that's certainly expertise dependent mm -hmm. uh, and that's the issue but i think trying to reclaim the bile duct um, <laughs> operatively uh, is certainly uh, a push at least from our institution um were, did any of these patients have uh, interoperative clandrogram with their cholecystectomy did you look or were you able to tell that no we based it off of the ercp and if there were stones extracted from the, from that procedure in did you have any data on the length of time between ERCP, MRCP, and surgery itself? I do not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next one will be all blood is the same. Survival benefits of whole blood compared to component therapy are observed in community trauma care. Presented by Dr. Tyler Johnson from Spartanburg Regional Healthcare System. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us on the last day of the conference. Um, as you said, I'm Tyler Johnson. I'm the PGY4 at Spartanburg Regional. I want to thank the Southeastern Surgical Conference for the opportunity to present our data. It's here. Uh, we have no financial disclosures to discuss. Uh, so for our background, uh, trauma remains the leading cause of death for basically all comers under the age of 45. Um, of those trauma patients, exsanguinating hemorrhage continues to be uh, one of the leading causes of mortality in, these, in this patient population. Um, as we've moved forward, component-only resuscitation has become sort of the standard of care for trauma and the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio in the attempt to recreate the whole blood that is lost um, in these exsanguinating traumas. Um, studies from both the military and large civilian centers have shown that both whole blood is safe and efficacious uh, in these populations. 
However, all of these prior studies at civilian centers have all been done uh, at very large urban academic trauma centers. And so an experience with whole blood resuscitation has not been uh, previously discussed um, at community trauma centers. And so we wanted to present our findings to expand the applicability of whole blood resuscitation in trauma patients sort of across the board for trauma centers. So our hypothesis was that whole blood resuscitation does not need to be limited to these larger urban academic trauma centers, and that we would see the same improved mortality benefits that these larger centers see. So we conducted a retrospective review of consecutive trauma patients admitted to our community center who received either whole blood or component as part of their massive transfusion resuscitation. Uh, this included years 2017 to 2021. Uh, and whole blood became available at our center in 2019. Uh, during that period, following 2019, we had two units of cold stored uh, O positive blood immediately available in our trauma bay. Um, and so for our cohort study, uh, patients in the whole blood group received at least one unit of whole blood uh, during their resuscitation. We performed both a univariate and multivariate analysis. Uh, our statistical analysis was conducted using a 95% confidence interval, and we used our multivariable analysis to see the usage of whole blood on survival for patients, and the wall test was used to identify both the whole blood group showing that um, age, gender, injury, severity, sore, and seen uh, stalled blood pressures were uh, all similar across the board for our whole blood group. So for results, uh, we had 576 patients that were included in our criteria fairly well equally matched on both the whole blood and the component resuscitation only group with 201 in the whole blood and 375 in our component. Uh, the groups were basically equally matched across the board, both to their injury severity score, as well as their abbreviated injury score. Um, as you can see, both for head, chest, abdomen, uh, and extremity, uh, both admission physiology and scenes of solid blood pressure and heart rate were uh, equal basically between the two groups. Um, and while our statistical analysis did show a significant survival benefit in our whole blood group, uh, we didn't see a change in length of ICU stay or ventilator days. Um, but what we did see was that administration of whole blood as part of a massive transfusion protocol um, resulted in an independently associated um, advantage in survival to discharge regardless of age, injury, severity score, uh, or presenting vital signs. This is sort of a table showing um, the categories across that board showing uh, very statistically significant um, findings for both all of those if you received whole blood at our trauma center. There are some limitations to our study. Obviously, this was a retrospective review. Uh, this was not randomized going forward. Uh, it is a single center. Um, we also had a relatively small sample size. And as far as broad applicability, uh, we did not include any women of childbearing age because this was RH positive blood and they were uh, treated primarily with our component resuscitation um, with a separate uh, blood cooler. So for a discussion, again, this is, you know, something that's been we've seen kind of over and over again in some of the trauma literature that whole blood resuscitation is both safe and efficacious. Um, we showed uh, at our center and this confirms uh, from other prior studies that whole blood does confer an independent associated survival benefit discharge, regardless of presenting injury severity score, uh, presenting uh, physiology or age. We feel that whole blood should be in incorporated across the board uh, at trauma centers that are able to, to obtain it and, and utilize it. And we sort of showed that, um, you know, you don't have to only resuscitate people with whole blood at uh, large trauma centers and that a program at a community level community level is safe, feasible, and more importantly, improves patient outcomes. Uh, these are our references. Uh, thank you for your time and attention, uh, and I'm certainly willing to welcome any questions. Is there any understanding as to the mechanism as to why um, whole so blood is better? process is still sort of going on, but there is uh, some thought that um, there's factors within whole blood that when you separate them out into component therapies that were missing in the components that whole blood provides, uh, specifically uh, benefits to the endothelium and the endotheliopathy that occurs uh, following massive blood loss and trauma. Thank you. Our next paper is comparative analysis of NISQIP national and institutional outcomes for 
for robotic gastrectomy, the future of gastric section presented by Dr. Butano from the Florida Hospital, Tampa. Morning, everyone. My name is Vince Butano. I'm the minimally invasive fellow at Advent Health Tampa. I'll be presenting our work on robotic gastrectomy comparisons in the NISQIP database. Uh, reports across the globe have been showing uh, that robotic gastrectomy is having uh, improved outcomes as compared, obviously, to open and laparoscopic procedures. What we did is we decided to take our robotic experience, which is quite extensive, and compare it to the NISQIP database. We took 73 gastrectomies from 23 to 2022. We're not a super high volume center, but we did have 73. Uh, we looked at the patient demographics, the uh, operations and recovery uh, data, and we compared it to the ACS uh, NISQIP data from 2012 to 2022 as well. And we compared it, we put the preoperative variables into the NISQIP risk calculator and uh, saw what our results were, our actual results were in comparison to the NISQIP risk calculator as well as the NISQIP national data. So here you can see the preoperative and intraoperative variables. Uh, we had 73 patients, uh, roughly age 65, uh, operative duration. Uh, the robotic does take longer, everybody knows that. It's about 245 minutes. Uh, and then our EBL is about 50 cc's. We had zero conversions to open, harvested about 12 lymph nodes per operation. 30% were total gastrectomies, while the remainder were uh, partial gastrectomies. And the pathology was 35% uh, adenocarcinoma. Post-operative variables, uh, we have about 8% uh, of pulmonary complications. We have a very low SSI rate of 1%. And here you can see some financial data uh, as everybody's aware, the robotic is a, a more expensive platform. And the meat of the matter here, uh, we have the NISQIP data, and you can see that I've highlighted the, uh, the p-values that were less than 0 0.05. Uh, the actual complications were much lower than the predicted uh, outcomes using the NISQIP risk calculator, as well as the national outcomes on NISQIP at 15%. And then again, our SSI rate, very, very low. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I can attribute that to the robotic approach, but it's definitely uh, notable as you know, it was 10% national or in the risk calculator, 9% nationally. And then uh, return to the OR is quite low as well as uh, readmission rate. Uh, this is likely due to pain. And our length of stay is generally about four or five days, which is quite low in comparison to the, the risk calculator saying it's about eight days. Uh, in conclusion, our robotic gastrectomy yields excellent outcomes. Uh, frankly, it's most likely the future of uh, laparoscopic surgery. Our patients experience significantly shorter hospital stays and reduced complications in comparison to NISQIP data. And I think the NISQIP uh, risk calculator, the only way to put it, a uh, robotic gastrectomy in is, is you have to put it under a laparoscopic gastrectomy. So I think in the future, they're going to have to do a, a specific robot uh, robotic approach for the NIST Clippers calculator. Thank you. Thanks for the nice presentation. The I'm sure you in your writing your paper you saw the Dutch experience where they looked at um, esophageal gastrectomies, minimally invasive versus open, and found a significant improvement with a minimally invasive approach. They did a same regionalization approach for gastrectomy and found no improvement for minimally invasive surgery, um, which was a little bit surprising. Yeah. Uh, so are you concluding that your data are different than that prospective Dutch data or how do you rectify those findings? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we did notice that. Um, basically, I think our N is too small. Uh, it's only 73. You know, we we need a much much bigger sample size to actually come to a, a reasonable conclusion. The Dutch prospective study, I think, uh, I don't know, I don't remember, is way more than seventy three. I can safely say that. Um, but I I think their data is probably more robust, and we need to enlarge our our end before coming to any major conclusions like that. So, uh, Manny Zerbos from uh, ECU, uh, what percentage of the gastrectomies were for cancer? And then how do you reconcile um, your oncologic outcomes given your uh, suboptimal lymph node harvest uh, 
with the uh, COC standard being a minimum of 15 lymph nodes. Yeah, that is one of our, our, our concerns. Uh, given the, the low number of lymph nodes, uh, the, the, our number of uh, adenocarcinoma is 30%, and the remainder were gists and uh, things of that nature. Um, but our... Yeah, it was still only about 14. Yeah, and so it, it, it is a major concern of ours and something that we need to work on as a center. I, I think if you looked at, you know, places like Korea and uh, where they do a standard uh, lymph node harvest of like 20 or 30, um, I think you get better data. I, they, they frankly operate on uh, adenocarcinoma much more frequently than we do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation will be acute kidney injury and hypotensive trauma patients following resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Our presenter is Iris Hunt from Louisiana State University. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Iris Hunt. I'm a third year medical student at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. Um, I would like to thank SCSC for the opportunity to present um, my presentation on acute kidney injury and hypotensive trauma patients following resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Uh, so we do have one disclosure for this project. Dr. Allison Smith um, is an advisory board member for the Primetime Medical. So Reboa, for those of you who don't know, is a catheter that's used in um, hemorrhagic patients who are hemodynamically unstable. It's inserted through the femoral artery up into the aorta, and it's inflated to uh, occlude the aorta, and it prevents distal blood perfusion to increase proximal pressure. The most common type of Reboa that's used is the ER Reboa, and it's a total aortic occlusion. Um, but, but with that comes some problems. Uh, it causes kind of ischemic related injuries. Uh, so there's a newer type of Reboa that's only used in 15 hospitals right now. It's the P Reboa. Um, and kind of the goal of this is to reduce ischemic related injuries while still maintaining a proximal pressure of at least 90. So we chose to look at AKI specifically in this project because um, as we did like clinical data review, we couldn't find any, any projects that had previously done this. Um, and AKI is associated with really poor health, health outcomes um, and increases rate of CKD and increases the rate that patients um, wind up at ESRD. So um, additionally, it has really high um, cost burden on the healthcare system. It actually costs more annually than MI and uh, GI bleeds. Additionally, it's used by uh, TQIP as, um, sorry, their quality indicator for risk-adjusted benchmarking program. So some of the objectives for our project were to compare the rates of AKI in patients who received the ER Reboa versus the P Reboa, and then we also evaluated clinical outcomes between the two groups. So we used a combination of database and chart review, and we received all patients who entered our trauma bay who had a systolic blood pressure that was less than 90, um, and that was about 1,075 patients. From that, we had 121 patients who underwent Reboa procedures. We removed nine patients who had rhabdomyolysis um, due to other causes such as crush injury or um, severe vascular injury. And then we also removed 45 patients due to death within the first 24 hours because we felt we couldn't properly evaluate them for AKI. So from that, we had 67 patients who made our, met our study inclusion criteria. Um, and then with that, we had 15 patients who had p Reboa procedures and 53 patients who had the ER Reboa. So our institution switched to p Reboa on June 14th of 2021. So any patient who came in after that date was put in the p Reboa group. Uh, we used chi-square analysis for dichotomous data and a t-test for continuous data, and we had a p-value that was less than 0.05. For demographic data, um, our groups were very well matched, and there was no statistically significant difference in uh, gender or age. 
um, for mechanism and ISS, we also had no significant difference between groups. Um, in both groups, the majority of patients were blunt trauma and the most common mechanism was MVC. For outcomes, um, we found that rates of AKI were significantly lower in the P-Reboa group when compared to the ER group, ER Rebo group. Um, also, not up here, but in the ER Rebo group, um, out of the 17 patients who had an AKI, five of those wound up needing dialysis. And in the P-Rebo group, none of the patients needed dialysis. <clears throat> um, we found no significant difference between amputations or mortality. For length of stay, there was a significant difference. Um, the P. Rebeau group was longer, but we did have a significant outlier. We had one patient who was there for 168 days. So when that outlier was removed, there was no significant difference. So some of the limitations of our study was that it was very small sample size, only 67 patients. It was also a single center design and it was retrospective. Um, additionally, we kind of had, since this was a retrospective study, there were some inconsistencies when how, with how Reboa information was recorded within our charts. Um, our hospital system is actually enrolling in a prospective study, like a multi-center study, so that should be rectified in the future. <clears throat> so in conclusion, the re results from our study suggest that patients with P Reboa placement have a significantly lower risk of developing AKI compared to ER Reboa group. Um, and there was no difference in mortality or amputations. Um, I would like to thank the trauma surgeons at LSU, especially Dr. Smith, who is my mentor for this project, and also Logan Gold, who's another medical student who worked with me a lot on this. Um, I've also included my contact info if anyone wants to reach out about it. Thanks. Any questions? Hi, Michael Mount from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, we use the partial Reboa. And when you first put it in, you can inflate it to full occlusion or to partial occlusion. So do you have any comment as to how that's done at your center? Yeah. Is it it's always starting with full occlusion? And then also uh, rates of CT scans and use of IV contrast, either with the, the partial or full occlusion or at any point uh, as how it affects your AKI rates? We did not look at rates of contrast used. Um, for our center, I'm not exactly sure how inflated the P. Reboa is. As I mentioned, there were some inconsistencies in how the data was reported. So it would occasionally be mentioned in a chart, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, that's something that we're working towards fixing though, so that all of this data recorded will be standard. And uh, for the pros prospective study we're joining, we'll, we'll be able to look at it more uniformly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Next paper, I'm sorry, next paper is pathologic tumor size versus mammography, sonography, and MRI in breast cancer based on pathologic subtypes. Uh, presented by Dr. Corey Nonemacher, um, Medical Center of Central Georgia, Navison Health. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Congress for allowing to, us to present our original work. We have no disclosures. Um, as we all know, the gold standard for imaging um, in breast malignant as well as benign disease has traditionally been mammography and sonography. Recently, MRI has become an adjunct for both benign and malignant disease, and the incidence of using that has increased over the recent years. Some studies have shown that MRI most closely predicts tumor size, but these studies were very small and did not differentiate between the different pathologic subtypes um, in malignant breast disease. We wanted to examine the differences in these imaging modalities and their ability to predict tumor size in relation to the pathologic size after excision. And then we similarly broke it down based on how this varied with our different pathologic subtypes of malignant disease. We did a four-year retrospective analysis um, looking at all our patients who were treated surgically for breast cancer at our facility. We excluded patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy in all of the male breast cancers that were treated. And then in our chart review, we identified all the different imaging modalities used for each patient, gathered the measurements from their charts, and then similarly reviewed all the pathology reports and reviewed the total size that our pathologists listed on their measurements. We then broke it down by pathologic subtypes of 
invasive ductal carcinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma, and DCIS. So when you look at all comers, so these are all pathologic subtypes linked together. We had over 600 patients that we looked at. Um, as you can see with the p-values on the right, mammography, there was no significant difference overall in pathologic size versus imaging size. There were significant differences in all comers with ultrasound and MRI with ultrasound underestimating tumor size by only 1.5 millimeters and MRI tending to overestimate tumor size by three millimeters. When we then looked at DCIS, once again, mammography showed no statistical significant difference. Ultrasound similarly, which isn't always a great imaging modality for DCIS, also didn't show a statistic difference when comparing imaging to pathology. MRI, on the other hand, significantly overestimated the tumor size in DCIS by nearly half a centimeter, or a little over half a centimeter, which was 5.7 millimeters. And this was statistically significant. Just anecdotally, there were a lot of MRIs that very significantly overestimated tumor size, sometimes by the manner of multiple centimeters. In invasive ductal carcinoma, we showed no significant differences, meaning that all of our different imaging modalities fairly accurately were predicting tumor size with ultrasound tending to slightly underestimated and MRI and mammography slightly overestimating. And then lastly, in invasive lobular carcinoma, which our N is very small, only 37 patients treated during that time, all three imaging modalities fairly significantly underestimated tumor size all over by all over half a centimeter with mammography approaching statistical significance and ultrasound reaching statistical significance. MRI did not in that patient population. So our conclusion Overall, mammography and MRI tended to overestimate tumor size, whereas ultrasound and all different pathologic subtypes tended to underestimate the tumor size. Our most st statistically significant finding was that MRI, specifically in DCIS, overestimated tumor size by over half of a centimeter, and all imaging modalities in relation to invasive lobular carcinoma underestimated tumor size. We do note that all of these differences are pretty small in the hands of a surgeon, all sub-centimeter, and likely wouldn't impact your decision-making preoperatively in regards to if a patient were to undergo breast-conserving therapy versus non-breast-conserving therapy, and likely these imaging differences also wouldn't impact a patient's decision to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But we do think that these are important things to take into account when you're doing your operative planning in regards to attempting to get adequate margins, knowing that maybe if you were basing your operative excision on DCIS, you might take a little more breast tissue than you need to. Whereas if you base it off of ultrasound, you might take a little less tissue and be more likely to end up with a positive margin. Thank you and I'll take any questions. Did you look at positive margin rates? for the uh, different modalities? Not in this analysis. We did exclude our patients that had positive margins because that would skew our ability to actually measure the pathologic total size. That was a nice presentation. This is always a, a thing we struggle with as a, um, surgeons, um, especially with MRI because MRI notoriously can overcall lesions. Um, and it was interesting seeing your different modalities, how that did play out. Um, so who do you, in your institution, who would you recommend uh, receive a, a preoperative MRI? Well, obviously patients who have a known genetic mutation tend to do that. Um, and, and then I think a lot of times we base it off of if something doesn't quite feel right, whether examination doesn't meet the ultrasound or mammography findings, um, sometimes if it's a younger patient, um, whose breast tissue density might be a little bit different, we would tend to do that. Obviously, if we had concern for bilateral disease. Um, but I agree, uh, the overestimation is what kind of led to us exploring this. We anecdotally would take a patient to the OR and do a pretty large excision and get path reports back that said, congrats, you got your five millimeters of tumor in this giant chunk of breast tissue. So, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to changing the playing field, a pre-hospital blood product pilot project in rural North Georgia, presented by Dr. Nathan Creel from Northeast Georgia Medical Center. 
Uh, hey there, good morning, everyone. Dr. Nathan Krill, Northeast Georgia Medical Center. I'm attending there, uh, level two trauma center. Um, basically, um, I think that everyone probably traveled here, uh, most of us via vehicle, but uh, some of us probably via plane. Um, and if you travel in North Georgia and the rest of Georgia, there are several areas where you may be in um, kind of a sparse populated area and a long distance from a trauma center. So um, if you think about that, um, there, I don't have any disclosures by the way, but uh, if you think about what it might take uh, for an accident or something to be transported to a trauma center, uh, it was raining when I drove here and helicopters, uh, almost all the helicopters in Georgia right now are BFR certified and not IFR. And so they might not be able to transport you. Um, most of those do carry blood products, including pack cells and plasma. Um, and so basically the question is, uh, what about EMS and, and ground crews being able to uh, carry that? So obviously I think we all agree that early transfusion is better for patients um, and transfusing other things other than blood products are probably gonna be um, worsening acidosis, making patients colder, uh, and worsening the, the uh, lethal triad. So basically the paramedics were not able um, to uh, initiate uncross-matched blood products or any blood products, um, but they were able to continue blood products started at other facilities. And so um, the idea of this study was to try to change that so that there could be a post licensure skill so that EMS crews could initiate blood products uh, in the field and um, uh, those uncrossed cross-match blood products could be continued. So, but it was a little bit difficult to uh, start on this project. So we kind of had to have a stepwise process of, you know, how feasible was this um, and then get some regulatory approval. There was some planning process, implementation, uh, and then kind of our results. So uh, we started off with feasibility. This has been done in other places. So we talked to um, the people in Southwest uh, Texas regarding how they did it, and they used whole blood specifically, uh, what kind of equipment they needed, kind of the cost and exchange process and protocols. Um, back. Regulatory approval. Um, I'm all over the place now, here we go. It won't seem to wanna to go to that slide. There we go. No? All right, well, um, we spoke with the governing body of um, uh, here in Georgia, which is uh, uh, the Georgia EMS. It's a really long acronym, and I wish I had my slide because I can't remember the whole name of it, but it's the Medical Directors Association um, of EMS, basically. And uh, we gave a presentation to them about blood product transfusion and kind of the safety of um, transfusing uncrossed mesh blood products um, to patients. Um, and ultimately they agreed on a pilot project. So what we did was uh, kind of started off with the pilot project as far as, you know, how do we train the, uh, the individuals? And we started a, a training program uh, that involves both the Thor network, which is an online training as well as hands-on and a written comprehensive uh, for our, all the paramedics that wanna be uh, involved. And so basically we would train the people that would train uh, the paramedics and so training the trainers and then they would continue that on through the different uh, uh, organizations. We uh, found some manufacturers that were willing to um, help us with this project and so a lot of the equipment was donated specifically to this which was a huge help uh, from a cost standpoint. You can see the different ones there um, and in this particular instance we did not use a, um, a validated refrigerator or um, uh, or freezer, um, but we instead used the Pelican cooler and uh, kept all the blood products in the Pelican cooler uh, with um, remote uh, temperature monitoring devices, which in this instance was from Temp Time. Um, and then we did use a warmer uh, with their specialized tubing. All right, this is the area, this is the Northeast Georgia corner, um, which is region two, uh, for those that you might, might not know. Um, there are 13 counties in region two, um, and we also serve kind of 18 counties in the extended area, which include some of North Carolina, as well as uh, some of South Carolina. And we are the only 
uh, trauma center in that area. It's a level two trauma center um, working on level one status as well. Uh, it's mostly rural, so there's uh, long transport times. So for us, it makes a real big difference. You know, some of these transport times may be two hours uh, by ground to get to us. Um, and so in those instances, um, if they can have some type of blood product transfusion uh, alternatives, it's a, a great option. Um, so six degrees Celsius was, were um, the cold uh, stored products that we used. Uh, we initially used liquid plasma because it is cheaper. That's about $50 per unit versus about $500 uh, per unit uh, for uh, unit whole blood. Uh, and later at the busiest uh, agency, we did use cold stored whole blood, which is O positive. Um, and then we used a lot as a questionnaire to the, uh, that was de-identified uh, for all the transfusions to determine the appropriateness of the transfusions since they are all on different medical records from ours. They didn't all go to our uh, system. Some of them went to uh, other trauma systems, and we were able to communicate with those because it was only two trauma systems total. Um, and then we reviewed all those cases. Um, here is the uh, guideline, which is very small, kind of hard to read, but it does include pediatrics, um, and you can see the criteria there. Uh, we did have some problems uh, in rural Georgia. The Wi-Fi is not always uh, adequate. It's not always adequate here if you've uh, connected to Wi-Fi. Um, so we did have a, a waste of 50 units initially because of that Wi-Fi. That's a pretty significant waste. 50 units of plasma, though, um, about $50 per unit. That's $2,500, which is not that expensive. I feel more about the plasma rather than the cost. But um, it, in the early stages, this was a problem. It's not a current problem. So um, just for those that might try to implement this, it may, it may be difficult. Um, there was a national blood shortage, so trying to limit the uh, transfusions and traumatic arrests. Uh, and then here are our results, 100 patients, 137 blood products, 82 liquid plasma, and uh, 18 whole blood. And there were no adverse events. Adverse events uh, were any reaction whatsoever to blood products. No one had any reaction other than improvement uh, in, uh, in their vital signs. And we, we did not have uh, really enough patients to kind of determine whether or not this was um, uh, statistically significant for outcomes, but ultimately uh, that is kind of the future. Uh, and you can see some of the data there from demographics, male versus female. Uh, anyway, here's our references. Uh, any questions? So with blood and blood products being really a scarce resource, you said you had 50 units that were wasted. Um, is it every EMS transport that goes out with blood products? Um, or is there some algorithm to figure that out? And um, tell us a little bit uh, about how you limit waste. Uh, so uh, there are um, supervisor trucks that are the ones carrying the blood. So the supervisor for the paramedics is the one carrying the blood products. Um, and there were initially two units per um, transport system, which was four um, different counties total. And so that transport truck would carry those two units to any terrible crash, uh, which they were responding anyway. Um, and in this instance, it's almost all exclusively blunt trauma, but some of those uh, were non-traumas, some of those PI bleeds, some of those obstetrical, uh, and one terrible nosebleed. Um, and, and in this particular instance, um, one thing that we did notice as far as waste was there's uh, in traumatic arrest, and so especially blunt traumatic, uh, traumatic arrest, um, utilizing those blood products were probably not uh, the best option since the transport times were going to be extended, and you know anything over. Uh, 15 minutes, blunt trauma arrest. I mean, even, even those less than 15 minutes, those arrive in blunt trauma arrest are probably going to die. So um, basically, we did limit those uh, transfusions if possible. Uh, John Hunt, New LSU New Orleans. Uh, you said you had one inappropriate uh, transfusion. How did you determine that? Uh, that was a blunt trauma arrest, uh, and they were 30 minutes from arrival. So. Did, you did you have any um, people that were transfused that were sent home from the emergency room? Um, I, I didn't look at that specifically, but as far as I know, no, we did not. Yeah, um, that, that's one of the things you'll have to kind of balance here as you put it out. You know, what are going to be the criteria? 
I mean, we've even had people like we've given blood to in the resuscitation bay, you know, who have been sent home. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that's kind of the other side of the balance in terms of, of figuring out who should get uh, blood free hospital. Right. And we did uh, review all of those cases. And as far as I know, we did not have anybody that was sent home. Um, they were all admitted with uh, all the different uh, variety of bleeding, GI bleed, and, and most of them were trauma, probably 70 uh, percent trauma. Yeah. Good work. Thank you. Next is the most satisfactory procedure in the field of pediatric surgery, the history of surgical treatment of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, uh, presented by Dr. Lovasek from Emory University. Hello, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> in a room of uh, presentations looking forward, I'll be the one presenting something looking backwards. Okay. Pyloric stenosis, um, very well known uh, today as a uh, common procedure in the pediatric uh, surgical community, um, once was not that, and that's what I wanna focus on today. It's really a, a combination of when adequate preparation um, beats um, dedicated study. Pyloric stenosis has been described since the early modern period, um, starting back in, uh, as early as the 1600s. Um, and I think uh, I'm gonna show you a few uh, examples of pyloric stenosis descriptions, and you'll start to see some of the very common uh, elements between them. Uh, in the 1640s, um, William Falbray von Hinden described an emaciated six-month-old boy um, who had a pyloric obstruction. In the 1700s, Patrick Blair in London uh, described similarly a one-month-old male with emaciation and vomiting who also passed um, from his uh, extent of malnutrition. Uh, in 1758, Christopher Weber, also in Prussia, also described a uh, young boy who was uh, affected by a uh, cartilaginous uh, uh, stenosis of the pylorus, again causing emaciation. I think one, uh, one of the common threads between these early cases is that we were identifying uh, patients who had these projectile vomiting episodes, but had no uh, method of giving them any adequate nutrition. In 1771, in Scotland, George Armstrong uh, founded the first children's clinic. He also described a case of pyloric stenosis among a child. And then the first case in the North American literature is by uh, Dr. Beardsley in uh, New Haven, um, who also described a case uh, with very similar presentations. A uh, brief sojourn, uh, Dr. Hirschsprung, who needs no um, uh, introduction to this audience, um, but I wanted to focus specifically on him because he's probably one of the first uh, people who had, had uh, provided uh, a scientific study to pyloric stenosis. He was the first pediatrician in Denmark, and he really focused his career entirely on uh, pediatric gastrointestinal uh, malformations. Um, he published his uh, doctoral thesis on esophageal atresias, and he was named the first uh, physician uh, to the um, Copenhagen's Children's Hospital. In addition to his uh, work on Hirschsprung's disease, he also um, uh, uh, published several uh, reports on therapeutic uh, treatments for intussusception, which at the time had an 80% mortality rate. He actually uh, first described um, a uh, uh, Hirschsprung enema, which we would consider a hydrostatic enema today, um, that decreased that mortality to about 25%. And then, of course, his uh, eponymous disease that he described in 1886. In 1887, he described uh, two cases of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, uh, interestingly, both in females, um, uh, which is not the traditional um, uh, presentation of this disease, um, but uh, both with similar presentations, both with uh, inability to um, uh, receive adequate nutrition. And in 1901, was among the first people to uh, describe a potential sur surgical uh, repair of uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Medical therapy at the time was largely palliative, um, uh, aimed at releasing the pyloric spasm, but of course, uh, uh, ineffective um, uh, treatments with gastric lavage, um, uh, cocaine, opium, belladonna, atropine, um, none of which were uh, adequately um, uh, relieving the pyloric spasm. Uh, and then uh, attempts at nutrition via um, nutrient enemas or subcutaneous um, infusions, uh, none of which were, uh, of course, effective. Surgery really became a uh, treatment option in the advent of antisepsis and anesthesia in the late 1800s. Um, a lot of the early treatments for pyloric stenosis were gained from uh, people who were treating either gastric cancers with pyloric outlet obstructions or um, uh, refractory ulcerative disease. Um, so uh, some of the first uh, attempts were all gastroenterostomies with gastrojejunostomies, uh, um, both of which failed. 
um, Dr. Loebker, um, who uh, studied under Bill Roth, um, attempted uh, and was the first one to successfully perform a gastroenterostomy um, for these patients. James Nickel, um, again, using similar methodology from the uh, 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 ulcer literature, um, was uh, doing a uh, essentially a pyloroplasty um, through forcible dilatation of the pylorus. And then Drs. Dent and Colley were the first to use Heineke Miklux uh, uh, pyloroplasty in order to uh, treat this disease. However, they were also unsuccessful. Uh, brief look in 1907 at some of the mortality rates associated with surgical intervention in these patients. Um, you can see uh, fairly dismal uh, success rates. Um, and a uh, quote from Dr. Volker should say be child by surgery or from surgery due to the poor prognosis. Some of the first successes came from uh, Dr. Ferde. He was a French surgeon born in Paris. Um, he uh, completed his uh, medical education in, the, uh, in Paris and then uh, set up at the um, uh, Hotel Les Invalides. Um, he uh, did his first procedure in 1907, where he performed a full thickness Heineke Miklitz pyloroplasty on emaciated infant. Um, that patient died on posteroperative day one of massive hematemesis. A month later, he attempted a submucosal, um, so just through the mu muscularis and serosa layers, um, but leaving the mucosa intact. And this was actually his first ever successful operation. Uh, you can see his description there, what we would describe as a, a very classic description. Um, they sized entirely through the muscularis, uh, spread the wound lips, and saw that there was bulging of the mucosa. He reported a series in 1908, um, some of the tenants that he uh, proposed early operation before the patient became emaciated and malnourished. Uh, an entirely extramucosal technique, and he was the first uh, person to use the word projectile uh, to describe vomiting. Dr. Ramstead, who's per perhaps the best known in uh, modern day literature, um, uh, is the one who uh, pioneered the um, Ramstead pyloroplasty. Um, he was not the first in Germany to be doing these operations. Uh, Wilhelm Weber um, uh, published a series of three extramucosal for day repairs uh, the year prior to Dr. Ramstead's first operation. In 1911, Dr. Ramstead um, was invited to treat uh, congenital pyloric stenosis in the firstborn son of a Westphalian gnomon, and it was actually the first time he'd ever treated a pediatric patient. Um, he'd intention, intended to perform the Ferday extramucosal technique with a, um, a, a Heineke Michelet's pyloroplasty. However, every time he tried to um, uh, throw his sutures, they always tore through the mucosa. So instead of uh, uh, actually closing the muscle, um, he just decided to leave a tag of momentum and close over the, top of that. Um, you can just see his description there, um, uh, essentially saying that he felt that he had relieved the obstruction uh, during his uh, muscularis division um, and did not feel the need to uh, further close the uh, muscularis. So he just put a tag of momentum over top and closed the patient. Patient went home uh, shortly afterwards and had a very uh, uh, unsuccessful, uh, uneventful recovery. He did his first planned Ramstead pyloromyotomy the following year. Um, and then uh, this rapidly spread throughout the continent, um, of course, unfortunately delayed by um, the uh, changes uh, associated with World War I and uh, prohibitions against uh, sharing of German materials. Again, I think uh, the uh, story of pyloric stenosis attributes a lot to uh, preparation in the uh, stages of study, and I'll uh, take any questions. Can you go back to the slide um, with the quote from for day about the interns? Yeah, <laughs> figured I'd just leave that up there. <laughs> it speaks for itself. He was uh, the the French Academy of Surgery had been disbanded after um, the French Revolution, and he actually in the 1930s was the first one to reestablish the French Academy of Surgery. Um, so, he, in addition to his uh, obvious uh, uh, treatment in uh, uh, surgery, he was also a very well-known person in the French uh, academies. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Our final uh, presentation will be the analysis of need for intervention following low-grade tra traumatic spleen injury presented by Alexandria Bontrager from Vanderbilt Medical Center.
All right, hello everybody. Um, I would like to thank the Southeastern Surgical Congress for the opportunity to present today. I will be talking to you about the timed intervention for traumatic spleen injuries. My name is Alex and I'm a third year medical student at Vanderbilt University. I have no disclosures, but am open to them. Okay, for my background, we know that blunt splenic injuries are common in trauma. And while patients with severe splenic injury sometimes require surgery, blood transfusion, or other procedures um, to stop bleeding, patients whose imaging studies show isolated low-grade splenic injuries often require no intervention. And this is recommended by the EAST practice management guidelines. These patients are typically managed with a period of inpatient observation, and while literature agrees that non-operative management is recommended for low-grade splenic injuries, it is unclear what observation interval or intensity is recommended to manage these patients safely, and there's insufficient data to support whether these patients can be managed in an outpatient setting. Understanding this lack of data in this study, we aim to define the interventions required for blunt low-grade splenic trauma, defined as grades one and two splenic injuries by the AAST. And because it is unclear what okay, because it is unclear what it, intensity of observation is appropriate for these patients, we sought to characterize the time to intervention for low-grade splenic injuries. With a leading hypothesis that splenic trauma does not require acute hospitalization. You can see a snapshot of our methods here. We included patients with an ISS less than 15, grades one and two splenic injuries, and a blunt mechanism of injury. The primary outcome measured was necessary intervention, which is defined here as the need for blood transfusion, splenic artery embolization, or splenectomy. The secondary outcomes measured were the time to intervention, which was defined from the time of arrival to the time of intervention and the hospital length of stay. Ultimately, 468 patients were reviewed and 107 of these patients met inclusion criteria. All right, and here is our results. Looking a little bit closer, we can see that almost 90% of patients required no intervention, which is again defined as no need for blood products, splenic artery embolization, or splenectomy. Moving forward, we can see that only, oh wait, you can see that here. 10, 10 of our patients needed blood transfusion. Um, and of these 10, of these 10 patients, four had bleeding from other injuries, four received only plasma for warfarin reversal, and two had significant cardiac events preceding their splenic injury. And the median time to intervention for all patients receiving blood products was only seven hours. Excluding patients who were on anticoagulation, the median time to intervention was four hours. Of note, 60% of all patients who needed blood products were on anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. Even fewer patients required embolization with only two of our patients receiving this intervention. One of these patients presented with return precautions with the worsening abdominal exam nine days post-injury. And the second patient did not have active extravasation on imaging, but instead had an end STEMI and hemoperitoneum on presentation. Finally, one patient received a splenectomy, and this was in the setting of a true low-grade splenic injury concomitant with hollow viscous abdominal injury. Our study has um, many limitations. One of them is that it is retrospective. We are subject to abstracting. Um, we were limited by what was documented and some patients lacked radiographs. We excluded some patients who had higher grade injuries and were documented, which suggests that we may have missed some low grade injuries in the data poll as well. Additionally, this is a single center study. Despite this, we do believe that our data is generalizable as we use methods that are common among all trauma centers such as the AAST grading score and ISS scores. Our conclusions are seen here. We can see that low-grade blunt splenic trauma has a low rate of intervention, which typically occurs within the first 12 hours of presentation. And if um, the median time to intervention was only 9.4 hours. Importantly, many of these interventions were performed in patients who would not be candidates for outpatient management, such as those with bleeding from other injuries, on anticoagulation, or with other extenuating circumstances. Altogether, this data suggests that outpatient management with return precautions may be appropriate for select patients with low-grade splenic trauma. 
Moving forward, we hope to expand the cohort to a multi-center retrospective study, including multiple level one trauma centers. And the ultimate goal is to refine outpatient follow-up methods that safely allow patients with low-grade injuries to be discharged after short observation. I'd like to thank the Southeastern Surgical Congress for the opportunity to present and will now accept questions. You need to find the term short observation period. So our data showed a median intervention time of 9.4 hours. So that is what I would define at this time as short, um, but more and numbers, of course, will be necessary to further characterize that. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for attending. The next session starts in about six minutes upstairs in the main ballroom. Yeah, that's me. Um, I, 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 I